We do appreciate everyone and your presence here this morning. And we invite you to be back this evening, of course, at 6 o'clock, and then our Wednesday evening services at 7. And we would encourage you to be here at all of those times. Also need to be making plans for our gospel meeting that will be coming up in October in which uh, Brother Rolf Ruffner will be with us and that will be uh, October, I think it's the second Sunday and goes through Friday. So be making plans to be here during that time and also to invite others to come and be praying for Brother Ruffner and that and his preparation, and because we know that he will be well prepared, he will uh, be doing a good job. And so let's make sure that we, though, are also inviting others and trying to get them to come and hear God's Word. Now, the last song that we sang about God is love, that certainly is one of the great characteristics of our God. And we certainly need to know about our God and His nature. Uh, but there are a lot of false ideas about God as well. And, and I turned it off instead of turning it on. So, there. In Acts 17th chapter and verse 23, the Athenians uh, had a lot of false ideas about God and thinking about their idolatry. As Paul would put it, as he began speaking to them, as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. And so Paul was going to declare this one true and living God to the Athenians, but they were, and the King James used it, very superstitious. It is, they were, in reality, very religious people. But they were religiously wrong, and they held many false ideas regarding God. Uh, they thought that God were, was those idols that they were worshiping. Uh, that among many of the errors that they uh, believed and that they held. Well, sad to say, there's still a lot of false ideas relating to God and His nature, His character, and just everything about God. And we've been noticing some of those errors as we've been studying this. Some thinking that God's power is limited to evolution, uh, that God could not somehow just speak everything into existence and it automatically come into existence. But that God simply had to start the process through evolution and then let evolution take over to accomplish what we see in our universe today. And, of course, finally, man. But that's not the way in which God says that he did it. He created man, uh, everything within this world within six 24-hour periods of time. But some think God is simply an American God. That um, he, instead of realizing that God is a God for all, and that uh, we sometimes get the idea that it, it, God's limited to here in the United States, uh, and many times the white middle class Americans, uh, so we don't take those to uh, the gospel to the poor, and those who are rich, well, they're not going to listen anyway, so we don't take the gospel to them, and we just exclude groups of people likened to that. But God is certainly a God for all. He loves the whole world. He died for, Christ died for the whole world, and for every man, and Thus, he is going to judge all men. But also, some think that God is a physical and local God. That he can be contained in a well, a building like unto this. Uh, 
the Jews thought that he was to be worshipped only in Jerusalem. The Samaritans, and when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman in John the fourth chapter, asked that question, we worship here in this mountain, that's Mount Gerizim. You worship in Jerusalem. Which is the right place of worship? And Jesus, of course, identified the nature of God, that he is spirit, and thus any location in which you're worshiping God is proper, that he can be worshiped at any place, that he's not confined to a building even as this building. And yet, how many times do we think, well, we'll come to this building and we'll be holy and we'll be righteous and we'll act uh, in a proper way, but when we leave the building, we leave God in the building. And we think we can get away with that. And so when we leave this building, we act like the world, we live like the world, we speak like the world. We're just like they are instead of being the type of Christian that we need to be. And then we looked at the aspect that some think God left man or created man and then left him all to himself. The idea of deism, that God just created everything they go God's involvement to that extent, but that's the extent of it. Nothing else. And he just kind of, as some have expressed it, he wound the world up like a clock, and now then he's just letting it run down without ever involving himself in it. But obviously, if God created the world as he did and cares for a man as he does, then he's going to be involved in the affairs of man. And he will work today through providential means to carry out the, the desires even of those who are his children. But also, some think that God is a God of confusion. That, in effect, that God has called one man to deny what he calls another individual to affirm. that, And this is really the, the positional, position of the Pentecostal in the idea that God sends his Holy Spirit to this individual. And this individual, speaking by that Holy Spirit, will teach one thing, but then God sends the Holy Spirit to this individual as well. And... That man, speaking by the Holy Spirit again, says something that's completely contradictory to the first man. And so you have two different individuals speaking the exact opposite thing, and yet both of them being led by the Holy Spirit, supposedly. And I say that's what the position of Pentecostalism is driven to. Give a good illustration of that. You have one group that claim to be the inspired of the Holy Spirit. They receive the Spirit. They are guided by the Spirit. And they teach that there is but one God, not three persons within the Godhead, but that there is only one, and that that one holds the different offices of being a Father, or being the Son, or being the Spirit but there's only one being. They're called the Pentecostal one or the oneness, holiness group. You have other groups, again, claiming to be led by the Holy Spirit, having direct guidance from the Holy Spirit, and they say, no, that first position is wrong. There's not but one God. There's three beings who all possess the nature of deity, and thus all are God. You have a Godhead thus. And that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all three different beings. Well, that's really the biblical position, but both of these groups are, being, are claiming to be led by the same Holy Spirit. And yet they say two totally conflicting and teach totally conflicting doctrines. And so what we end up having is that God is a God of confusion. Which one's right? 
Well, both of them have to be right because both of them supposedly are being led by the Spirit. But, you know, logic and, you know, logic is not something that's evil, as some people think. You say the word logic and all of a sudden they're, oh, that's evil, that's wicked, that's man's thing. No, it is simply thinking rationally. God said, come now, let us reason together. That's using logic. Isaiah 1 and verse 18. Logic says that two things that are contradictory cannot both be right. It's not reasonable. If I say that I am in this building and I am outside of this building at the exact same time, how many of you are going to believe that? Well, if you do, then I've got some land to sell you. It's going to be real prime land, but uh, you immediately know because it's not rational for me to be both inside this building and outside of the building at one and the same time. It's an impossibility. And yet, that's what they would have us to believe in relationship to God. That God is telling this group one thing and telling this group something else and those two ideas are totally opposite. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians the 14th chapter and verse 33 that God is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. If this idea, and they might not say that God is actually the author of confusion, but if this position that both groups are being led by the Holy Spirit, it does cause confusion, and God is not the author of peace then, God is the author of confusion, which is just the opposite of what Paul is, states here in 1 Corinthians 14.33. It's also, in reality, the position of the majority of the denominational world. I don't have that up, up here, but in reality it is. The ecumenical approach that is seen today and that has made its way into the Lord's church is basically a God, makes God a God of confusion. Why? Because this group says one thing and another group says something that's totally opposite and both of them are going to go to heaven. Both of them are acceptable to God. Well, if that's the case, then God is presenting something to us that is totally opposite of each other, and it makes absolutely no logical sense. It is not reasonable. And thus, God would be the author of confusion. This group here that says one thing is going to heaven, and this group over here that says something exactly the opposite of what the other group says, they're going to heaven too. How can that be? And yet that's what the denominational world as a whole wants us to believe. That God is a God of confusion. That everything's all right. And the, really the only thing that matters is as long as you're sincere, then that's all that matters. And that what you believe, well, that doesn't matter because you're sincere. Denominationalism in effect, leads to the immorality that we're seeing in our society today. Why? Because they say, from I, if doctrine doesn't matter, well, morality is doctrinal. It comes from doctrinal teaching. And if it doesn't matter, then if one believes in homosexuality, you can't really say that he's wrong. If he's sincere in that, he's going to go to heaven too, and God has to approve of it. And if you want polygamy or polyandry or if you want child aspect and incest and everything else, well, as long as those individuals are sincere, it has to be all right. And they're going to have to go to heaven. Why? Because that's the viewpoint of our of denominationalism. It makes God the author of confusion, and God's not. In Philippians, the uh, third chapter and verse 16, 
Paul says, nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Notice the sameness there, the same rule, the same thing, as far as our mind. Not a difference, not a distinction between them, but we all have, there's one rule. It's the same rule, not different rules. And yet, the ecumenical approach and the Pentecostal approach ends up saying, well, different rules are, is fine. Different faith is all right. How many times do we hear, well, what faith are you? Well, there's only one faith. That's what Paul would write in Ephesians, the fourth chapter and verse five, that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one faith, not a multitude of faiths. One faith. Jude would write in Jude in verse three, that when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints. There is that the faith. It is a very definite article. One particular one. Not just simply a faith. Not one of many faiths. But it is the faith. It is that same rule that Paul wrote there in Philippians 3 and verse 16 that we had walked by. A unity that is there. And that one faith, in reality, is going to end up producing unity. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, the Lord's Prayer, as recorded in the 17th chapter of John, prays first for himself in verses 1 through 5, and then in verses 6 through verse 19, he prays for the apostles, and then starting in verse 20, he begins praying for everyone else. And he says as he begins praying for everyone else, neither pray I for these alone, that's the apostles alone there, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. He prays for a unity, that they may be one. But notice how that unity is going to come about. Neither pray I for these long for them which shall believe on me through their word. There's the way that unity is going to be accomplished. It is through the word which the apostles are going to be speaking. And if we had time this morning, we could go through and show and, and we would see how that God had given his son a specific word that he was to give. John, the 12th chapter, verse 48 through 50, shows that, along with other passages. The Son then gave that same word to the apostles. John, uh, the eight, well, the 17th chapter, verse 8, 14 and 18. They were going to be guided by the Holy Spirit. John 14, verse 25 and 26, and John 16, 12 and 13 to bring everything that Jesus said. Now, what was Jesus saying? It was what the Father had told him to say. So he was going to bring to their remembrance all that Jesus had said because he was not going to speak of himself, but he was going to speak of the Father which would send him. And now then, the apostles go out and they began preaching and teaching that word. And when we believe that word, it is singular in nature, not, Jesus doesn't say here, but for them also which shall believe on me through their words, plural, he says through their word, singular, because it is singular in nature. There is a unity. Whether Peter was preaching it, or James, or John, or Andrew, or any of the other apostles, 
It was the same word. There was a unified word that they were speaking, and thus he uses the singular, believe on me through their word. Why? Because there's only one faith. Not a multitude of faiths. It's not what it means to you, and what it means to me might be something different. There is a unity that is there. That's going to produce the unity that Jesus prayed for, that we all might be one. In 1 Corinthians, the first chapter and verse 10, Paul would write, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. There's that unity that Christ prayed for there in John 17. That there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Notice also that ye all speak the same thing. That's exactly what Jesus said in that prayer in John 17 verse 20, that they might believe on me through their word. We speak the same thing. It's the Word of God, not the Word of man. It's not right for me to get up and preach and teach my opinions, what I think and what I feel. It's what does the Bible say. If my teaching and my preaching doesn't measure up to the standard of what the Bible says, then it needs to be rejected. But the same principle holds true with what anyone says. Thus, John would write, 1 John 4 and verse 1, Beloved, try the spirits, whether they are of God, for there are many false prophets that are gone out into the world. Put everyone to the test. Make sure that it's that standard of the word. The faith. Because if it doesn't measure up to that, then it's false doctrine. And it's going to condemn. But... You speak the same thing. When you're all speaking God's Word, and you might uh, reference uh, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. There's that word that we speak, the oracles of God. So you speak the same thing. Then you have the same mind. What is that mind? Well, it's a mind that's developed by the Word of God. We go to God's Word, and we have the mind of Christ. As Paul would write in Philippians, the second chapter and verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You have the mind of Christ. What was the mind of Christ? To do the will of the Father and to speak His Word. What should our mind be? To do the will of the Father and speak His Word. There's the mind that we are to have. A mind that's guided by the pages of the New Testament. And then we have the same judgment. That is, the same action. We act in the same way. Thus, you're not going to have one group over here teaching and acting one way and another group over here teaching and acting another way. They're going to be doing exactly the same thing because they're teaching the same thing. Why? Because God is not the author of confusion. Let's face it, in our society today, and with the thousands, literally thousands of religious groups all claiming to be of Christ, it causes confusion. That person in the world who all of a sudden, they realize, well, you know, I know that there's a God and I know I need to do what He wants me to do. And then they look, go down into the yellow pages and start looking and they start saying, and here's page after page after page of all of these religious groups, all claiming to be of Christ now and all teaching different things. And people just throw up their head, hands and they reject religion outright. Why? Because they don't understand that and because division has come in as a result of teaching things that are not in accordance with God's will. And people want to act in a way that's not in accordance with God's will. And so they go over here, they run out, and they start a new religion. Claiming to be of Christ, yes. 
and causing greater confusion. And then this ecumenical movement that we see in our society today will say, well, everyone's all right. Everyone's going to be acceptable with God. Even though they teach something that's totally contradictory, they're still both right. No, they're not. When you have conflicting doctrines, you have a situation where one is right and the other is wrong, or the other is right and you're wrong, or you're both wrong. We both cannot be right. But I do know what is right, and that is God's Word. And when we stick and adhere to the Word of God, then we will be right. Because God's not the author of confusion. He's the author of unity. And he, His Word will produce unity when we follow that Word and walk by that same rule. But also some believe that God is reluctant to save. This concept gave rise to the mourners' mint religion. The idea that I've got to go over here and I've got to, uh, I realize I'm lost in sin, but I've got to plead with God to save me. I want to be saved, but I can't be saved. And so I sit there mourning, pleading with God, please save me. Now, that came as a result of Calvinism and Calvinistic doctrine. Calvinism came along and said, well, here's the nature of man. He is totally depraved. And because man is totally depraved, he cannot obey God. He can't do anything that would please God. And so he has to wait for God to send the Holy Spirit into his life, and then the Holy Spirit will convict him of his sins and convert him to God, to Christ, and then the Holy Spirit will purify him once he saves him so that he remains faithful throughout his life. But what about this individual who realizes he's in sin and he's not saved? Well, that's thus the mourner's bench. He goes over to that mourner's bench and he mourns his state, pleading with God now, please save me. It also rises to this idea that is a misconception that we're seeing more and more in our society that God is somehow this being out here that He's just waiting for us to make a mistake so He can grab us and throw us into hell. He doesn't care about us. He doesn't want us to be saved. He wants to just to throw us in hell and be done with us. But that's not our God. Our God is not one that we have to plead with to save. Um, in fact, God has a desire to save. He wants to save us. In 1 Timothy, the second chapter, in verse 3 and verse 4, Paul would say, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into a knowledge of the truth. What is God's desire? He will have all men to be saved. God does not want anyone to be lost. No one that has ever lived upon the face of this earth, no one who ever will live, God wants all of them to be saved. Each and every one. In Second Peter, the third chapter and verse 9, Peter says that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What is it? God does not want anyone to be lost. And within the context that Peter is setting forth here in Second Peter, you have that there are those who are scoffers, mockers, saying, where is the promise of His coming? 
For since the beginning of the creation, all things continue as they are. That's the doctrine uh, that scientists call uniformitarianism. That the present or the uh, past is the key to the present. And that you go back into the past and everything is always exactly the same. But Peter says they've forgotten a few things. For one thing, they forgot about the flood. And they're saying, well, all things are just going to continue on. Why? Because they always have. And Paul or Peter gives the reason things are continuing even now. Because God is long suffering to us work. Does that mean that God is never going to come and there's not going to be that second coming of Christ and this world be destroyed? No, Christ will come. When? Well, that's in God's knowledge. No one knows. Matthew 24. But we can be assured that He will come and when Christ does come, Peter goes on to show that everything in this world will be destroyed, will be burned up. Why hadn't it already taken place? Here's the reason. God is long-suffering. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. And so He is giving man time to repent. Why? Because He doesn't want man to be lost. He doesn't want man to go to that place of eternal torment. He wants man to spend eternity with Him. And so He's patient. He's long-suffering with us. And He's desirous of our repenting and coming to Him. The very purpose that God sent His Son into the world to die for the world John three sixteen and 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. There's God's desire. He wants man to be saved. Why? And what did He do to accomplish it? Well, He sent His only begotten Son into the world. Brother Hugo McCord, in his translation, he mistranslates this word only begotten, but he said in his next edition that he was planning on changing his translation from only begotten to whatever he had it to the word darling. Now, that's not a right translation either, but it certainly expresses a beautiful idea that God sent His darling, that one that was of great preciousness to Him, that that's who He sent to this world to die for sinful mankind. Why? Because He has a love for us and He wants us to be saved. And so instead of turning it around and pleading, man pleading with God... We have to plead with man to be saved. In Acts 2 and verse 40, when Peter has preached this first gospel sermon, and the men of Jerusalem, at least some of them, cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Because they realized they had crucified the Son of God. And Peter tells them to repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and your children and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And then it says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation, or this crooked generation. Peter was pleading with man. Save yourselves. He recognized God sent His Son into the world because of God's love for a man.
to die for sinful mankind and God wants man to be saved. But now then it's up to man to decide whether he will be saved or not. And so there he was on that day of Pentecost pleading with them, exhorting them, obey the gospel, obey the truth. Be saved. That's what God wants. That's why Christ died upon the cross. Now you have to do it. The decision is up to you. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 11, Paul says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I realize, I know the terror of God. And yes, God is someone to be terrified of. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew the 10th chapter and verse 28, Fear not him which is able to destroy the body, but cannot destroy the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear God. Keep His commandments is what Solomon's summation of... Ecclesiastes is in Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. Knowing the terror of the Lord that yes, He is a holy God and being holy and being just, He cannot associate Himself with sin and He must punish the sinner. And that punishment is going to be an eternity in hell fire of torment and anguish and pain. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. What do we do? We persuade men. We go out and teach them. We persuade them. We encourage them. We teach them. We plead with them. Obey the Gospel. Do what God wants you to do. Look at what God has done for you. As Paul would write in Romans 2nd chapter, that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Look at His goodness. Look at what God has done and be saved. Obey the truth. Do that which Peter says there on the day of Pentecost, that upon your faith in Jesus Christ as His Son, you repent of your sins, make the confession of your faith that you do believe in Him, and be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Obey the truth to the salvation of your soul. Why? Because... You know the terror of the Lord. And you know the goodness of God. And you know that God wants you to be saved. He's done everything that He can to save you. And now then the decision is yours. And what will you do with it? If you've obeyed the Gospel, but you haven't continued to live that type of life that God wants you to live, you haven't lived by that same rule that we read about in Philippians 3. And why not come back and once again be restored to where you live according to the faith so that you can have that home with God in heaven. If you need to come this morning to to be restored, to obey the truth, to get right with God so that He can save you, then why not come as we stand and sing the invitation song?